Welcome back to the Brennan T. Adams Audio Experience. I'm sitting here with Andrea Delmura, and we are going to go into a lot of stuff today from you being a warrior, beating cancer twice, to being a mother, to being an entrepreneur, and now opening up the Drip Bar in Rye, New York. So we're going to have some fun conversations about that, about health, about everything else. But before we get into that, what is one thing you remember from your childhood that stands with you that really like you feel kind of formed you into the the person you are today um without a doubt that's my parents yeah my parents um you know we didn't have a lot growing up but i never knew it they had a way of always making me feel very loved yeah um and uh, that's something that is a value that i really hold near and dear to this day what uh What's something you learned from your father? Oh, my dad. So my dad himself, he is a, he was kind of a tough guy. You know, he was a paratrooper in the army and um, he didn't have any boys and I was his first <laughs> daughter. Yeah. So in a sense, you know, he, he put uh, the value of family in us and also uh, protecting ourselves. Um, you know, and being street smart, that we grew up in a suburban area, but my dad was from the streets, and he made sure that his girls knew how to protect themselves and be wise. Yeah. Um, and it has served me in my life thus far. I can see in many ways. Yeah. What, what about your mother? My mom, well, my mom is also um, a breast cancer survivor like myself, yep. and um, she had to raise two, two daughters. And um, we're, thank God, you know, she's still around and we're such good friends now. You know, I pull from her wisdom and, and my sister and I both, actually, we joke with her a lot about, um, about our childhood and how back in the day we sort of raised ourselves. but honestly, she did an amazing job with raising two girls. So you graduate, what happened as soon as you graduated from, let's say, high school, turns to college, what was kind of your first let's say, endeavor you went towards professionally? So at the time, there really wasn't a lot of money. And so I decided to stay home and attend a community college, which I worked full time. And I also paid for my school. My parents helped where they could. Um, for example, I needed a car, right? So I got my driver's license. And my dad said, you know, you raise the money, I'll match it. And that's exactly what they did. And that was um, that was huge because now I had a vehicle to get around, and so they I, did that for your car. They did that for my that car. The same they thing. They did, and it, it it meant a lot. It really did because then it allowed me to do like little jobs. But mm -hmm. then I found um, when I was in school and getting an education, um, I was lucky enough that I was able to get a job at in a uh, in a company as a purchasing agent, and. Um, and for me, that was that was great because now I can get to dress all business, and I got to learn. Um, I got to learn from the ground up, and I was fortunate that um, they took a liking to me, and um, I guess my attitude of give me a job and I'm going to get it done. Um, I graduated with an associate's degree from the community college, and um, you know I was proud of that. But now I had an opportunity to really work and grow in the company. And um, at that point, I just I just went with it, and I was I became a buyer, um, and you know I was the first one to sort of bully the people around me that even did a report to me, and yeah. just to say we got to get this done. And I was lucky enough to travel to Europe and to Switz you know to Switzerland, and and um, as a young girl back then, um, that was huge. How old were you? I was in my early twenties, <clears throat> okay. and. Um, and at that point is when I um, discovered my first cancer. And you were how old? 24. It's 24 years old. Can you paint the picture for people listening? The moment you, where were you when you found out you had cancer and what went through your head? You know, um, it was one of those moments where I was rushing around trying to get everything done. And I, I literally, um, for whatever reason, I reached up to my breast and not that I was having pain, but I felt something. And I was like, that's weird, it was a hardening. Very, very strange. And um, so, of course, I called my doctor and said, hey, you know, I think there's something going on. And 
I had gone to get it checked out. And the first thing this person said to me was, well, you know, you're so young, maybe it's just a fibroid, let's watch it. And even at 24 years old, that didn't sit well with me. I'm like, well, okay, thank you, but I'm gonna take it to the next level. And I was fortunate enough to come across a doctor who was a female doctor, surgeon, real guru for her time. And she tried to abscess it and it was a solid mass. I mean, I could tell her concern was like, hey, whatever this is, we're just gonna get it out. So here I am, you know, 24 years old, prepping for surgery, not really understanding what exactly was gonna be happening. And I don't remember too much about the time uh, leading up to it, but I do remember at the time of coming out of the surgery. And it was very surreal. I remember laying in the bed and having the surgeon you know, with her funny, you know, mask and her little hat that had like characters on it. Um, and I remember her pulling down the mask and looking at me and basically her saying to me, um, I'm, I'm sorry, kid, it's, it's cancer. <sighs> oh, so at that point, what do you do? I said, okay, what do we do? Yeah. <sighs> but I, uh, I didn't know much. I didn't know what those words meant for a while, other than now the whole, okay, I have this, um, where do we go with this? So it happened very quickly. So now I'm introduced to you know, doctors, oncologists, and, and I'm going through tons of different testing. And so scared out of my mind. But the whole time I thought to myself, I'm gonna do what I am, Told to do, and I'm going to survive this, whatever this is. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I never, I never thought that I would die from it mm -hmm. because I felt like there are too many people spending too much time with me, and we're going to eradicate this. And so, lucky for me that the mask was gone and that they got clean borders, which meant that now I went to the next step of treatment. Now, what did that consist of? So I was sent down to Cornell University Hospital at the time, mm -hmm. and I sat in a room with a doctor who basically said, um, so this is really unusual. We normally don't have people your age coming down here, sitting here with us doing this. And so immediately the conversation went to my mom, who took the trip with me, and they started talking about me as if I wasn't even in the room. Yeah. And again, I felt like I had an out-of-body experience. And I heard the doctor say to my mom, like, she knows she's gonna lose her hair, right? Like, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, that sucks. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't think that that was gonna happen, but okay. So I went through the role of doing it is what, what I was supposed to do. Testing. Do you cut your hair or does it? So, you know, it was recommended because I had really long hair at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, for a young female too, it's your hair is your pride, mm -hmm. right? That, that's what it was. And so treatment, um, it, it takes you down. It mm -hmm. takes you down both physically and emotionally because it changes the way that you look. And so um, in your early 20s, that's really tough. Mm -hmm. Um, I did cut my hair, and um, by the time the first uh, chemo treatment came around, I thought, all right, not so bad, I can, I can, I can do this. Um, second treatment came around, and that was a different story. What did you feel like? The first treatment, I didn't feel much, just basically tired and a little nauseous. Second treatment came, and it was like, I got hit by a truck. Because mm -hmm. at the time when they gave you treatment for chemo, it was, um, they threw everything at you, you know, and um, there was medication in there that um, basically is why you lost your hair, right? Because it kills good cells and bad cells because it couldn't differentiate between cancer and good cells. So therefore, that's why you basically will lose the hair follicle, right? Because it's killing it. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're being poisoned is what it's doing because they're trying to kill this cancer. That's so it's, it's poisoning, you. hurting your body, but yeah. also taking away the thing that could Correct. kill you. So that's why you're being monitored. That's why they're... they're How long were you on this from you find out from the nurse, say, you have cancer, to like it didn't work, he was done. 
So it was a good six months. <clears throat> so six months of basically going through hell, yep. chemo. And so, and every time, so I would do chemo like every other week. And so every time you got around to that next treatment, you started feeling better. You started feeling better. You weren't vomiting. You weren't having blackouts. You weren't laying in bed so much. And you felt like any body mass that you had is now going to mush. And then you start feeling better. And it's like, oh, you have to go for another treatment. And you're like, oh. So, but again, after that second treatment, I knew, okay, this is this is gonna be really tough. And, and that's when my hair started really falling out. And it was dead in winter now too. So what would be your advice for a woman out there, anybody that finds out they have cancer, what would be your best advice of how to get through it with the best mindset, some maybe tips, tricks, hacks you have mentally so, that helped you cope with it and get through it? 100%. Um, I, you, listen, family and friends are huge. Mm -hmm. A lot of times family and friends, they don't even know what to say or do. Um, as a family member or a friend, the best thing you can do is to support them and ask, what do you need? What can I do? A lot of people can't relate and that's mm -hmm. okay. And a lot of people don't know what to say and, or they don't know what to expect. Um, and they do, they empathize with you. Um, but having a good support system and also having faith, right? Again, I said I never thought that I was gonna die from this until chemo started and I realized that the word cancer and having that, the treatment at the time especially back then in the 90s was much different than it is today. Today they can target certain things, the drugs that they have today, the treatments that they have today, so women I hear don't even have to go through the chemo. They go to work. They literally get a treatment and they can go to work. That is amazing. So having second opinions, I totally believe that. Any good doctor is going to allow you to go ahead and get a second opinion. My experience all those years ago is very different than what a lot of people go through now for treatment. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but your belief system, and it just having faith and surrounding yourself with good, loving people. So you got through it, first one. How many years until cancer came up again? So that was in 93, 1993, and now in 2008. So 15 years later. So at any time in the 15 years we didn't have it, did it ever come to your mind like, oh, I could get again, every thought process, like, oh, it might come back? No. It never crossed your mind? It never really did. It was almost like, you know, one and done. You know, I thought, well, now, and I'm being monitored now. Like, I'm being poked and prodded. Like, every, my oncologist I was seeing every three to four months. This is for years. We have a great relationship. I mean, um, never did I think. So when you got it again, let's go the second time. Is this for, for people listening right now that are going through it, anything, like giving them the best kind of blueprint of, hey, here's how you overcome it. Here's how you survive. Yeah. Here's how you thrive with it. Second time you found out, what did your mind, what was your mind going through then? Oh, so remember back in the 90s when I had my first cancer, I was 24. And so my lifestyle was a lot different then, right? I was, I was single, I was, there's no children, and I knew I had to have this treatment that was gonna basically take me down and I'd have to build myself back up. And so it was a lot different the second time around. Right, 15 years later, a, a whole different. I'm now, I'm married, I yes. have two children, and now it is different. And now I'm looking at this a little differently. Um, I was really surprised because, um, although the first time around I had a lumpectomy with clean borders, I did not need to have a double mastectomy at the time. This is what I was told. Really lived my life the way that I wanted to live my life. Um, cancer at that time especially didn't define who I was because now I'm a mom and I have a whole different set of challenges and friendships and you know building in this community that I just I just love and when I found out the second time around it was through a routine mammogram that is something that women especially do not skip do not push because timing is everything and I truly believe that in life and if I did not have that mammogram at that time, and if they did not see what they saw on that mammogram at that time, I could have went a whole nother year. Yeah. And that would have been a whole different outcome. So once you find out, 
tell me again what so filters you're adding, the unique, exact thoughts. The unique story about that was that, I, well, I thought, how, how freaking lucky am I? Because what they saw on the mammogram was a calcification. And what they saw next to it under a microscope were one millimeter cells. And we did a couple of different scoops. They went in to see if they'd get clean borders. Is it, is it isolated? And so it was not isolated. And so if they didn't see that calcification, um, I would have went back for my yearly mammogram, and it would have been um, it would have been blown out. It probably would have um, metastasized, um, and it would have spread. So how did you approach the second time around differently? You went through chemo again? No, what, I, was so for, I was fortunate. Actually, this is weird because I'll tell people that I felt so blessed because at that time having a conversation after going through a lot of testing otherwise and poked and prodded, um, when they came back and said, I really think that just doing the double mastectomy would be all. If we can get you clean, there's no treatment. And I thought that was a home run. That, that was a complete home run for me because now my lifestyle is so different. I have two kids and now they didn't have to see their mom lose their hair and look sick. Now it was just surgery and I can fake that. I mean, I can, I can put on a good face for my yeah. kids and my neighbors and my friends and, and that, that's what you do, right, for everybody else. Um, and that, that's what I did. And so I was grateful just to have the surgery and not to go through treatment again. So. To me, it was a home run. Okay, we get through this. During this time, you started doing IV therapy, correct? It was it was after, a little bit after that. Remember, IV therapy, um, it's been around since the 50s, right? Myers Cocktail, Dr. Myers, it's been around. So these were things that were not offered to me. Yeah. I didn't even know that they existed. On my own later, through different blood work that I was doing, I was deficient in certain things, and of course, you know, I'm not getting everything that I need through my, the food that I'm eating. And plus I'm a mom. It's like, you know, I don't come first. I put it, everybody else comes first and then you come. Although I was very good at keeping my appointments and yeah. making sure that I was well, but IV therapy didn't hit until a little bit later, until I started discovering things myself. And I, I did have um, doctors tell me that yes, this is probably something that you can do. So why did you specifically choose to do IV therapy? This is before you even thought about opening a drip bar location or anything. 100%. So after getting blood work done and finding out that I have like these different um, uh, genetic mutations, right, that mm -hmm. either led to cancer or didn't lead to cancer, whatever it was, my body wasn't able to absorb certain, certain nutrients. And so I thought to myself, this is a perfect opportunity to go ahead and and start IV drips. Now, again, my doctors were sort of like, they didn't know very much. This is going back like seven years, seven, yeah. eight years. This is this is a while. So new. It's so therapy. new. And but I figured the way that they explained it was that it's going right to the cell level. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. There's no supplement or food that for myself anyway, and to make sure that I'm getting what my body needs to be able to fight off whatever comes my way whether it be you know virus or cancer, right? These are the things we all know, the science is there. So for me, um, doing the IV therapy, um, it was fine. You know, did I enjoy going to an establishment that was very clinical and quite triggering actually too. Was it like we have now? Oh, no. It was more of like Nothing going like, like a doctor's. It's not like, oh, cool vibe, it let's reminded still get a drip. Me, it reminded me a lot of chemotherapy, honestly, and it yeah. was very triggering for me. And, um, a lot different now so what why if somebody listening because we both i mean both part of drip bar and your opening location ryan new york yeah. i've been a partner in the drip bar i've got a lot of drips <laughs> um i know my reasons for getting drips but yes. why somebody listening has never done IV therapy why should they go and get a drip what are the benefits of it how can it make their life better so how i explain it to people is that just, and it's my story, it really is the way that I discovered it, is that you, no matter what supplement that you're taking, you're really not absorbing probably as much as, as you need to, that your body needs. Um, we don't all eat, we know, we know we have to eat our vegetables and, and our fruits and everything, and we all know that, but do we have enough, do we get enough, do you get those eight servings a day or whatever it's it is? It's impossible to it's eat. It's impossible, either. plus myself, I'm always dehydrated, 
constantly. My family always tells me, Mom, what was the last time you drank something? What was the last time? We all try really, really hard, but we all lead really busy lives. So the benefit for, uh, for myself with IV therapy has been that I know that if I am deficient, and I'm deficient in bees, there's no doubt about that. I have proof of that. I know that I can go to a drip bar, and I can go and I can get an IV, and I know that what it is that I'm choosing at the time in my, in my IV bag is gonna go right to my cell level. And, and I can honestly, because of all the drips that I've had, I can physically feel it. I physically feel it. Um, I know, and it's that, it is that boost and that hydration, uh, but the vitamins that I am specifically deficient in, I can boost myself with that. And there is not a better feeling. Um, and that's, I truly believe it. My family does it, we love it. Um, and then when I had the opportunity and it clicked that, hey, I'm an empty nester, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? Um, I had this opportunity, I had to jump on it. I thought this How did it come is, about? How did Oh, so, did you know, um, it even come? so funny because um, I had a family member who basically said, hey, here, you're an empty nester. Have you ever heard of IV vitamin hydration? So I sat back and I giggled to myself and I said, hey, I've heard of it. Tell me more about it. And so I have a cousin who basically is an area representative for the drip bar. Yeah. And he thought, hey, you know, you would be probably a really good person to jump on board with this. And, um, and so I decided that I would be. And I decided that um, having my own franchise in something that I'm so passionate about and that I believe in. I mean, I, I believe it. I can sit back and probably retire if I wanted to at this point in my life, but that doesn't, it does, that doesn't feed my soul or my passion. And I think I found it. I, I gotta say, so first off, just the benefits I see in the drip bar, personally, instantly, when I'm hooked up, I can feel it. When I get done, the whole rest of the night, like I feel energy, I love the power pack, I love the all-star. I work out every day, so it helps me with my workouts. I feel better, more clarity. And it, like, I can't even make this stuff up. Like, it is crazy to say, like, people are like, oh, I feel like, look like you're on who drugs. Knew? Like, who would have known? Yeah. And it's fueling myself that it's, it's making me feel better, perform better. I always love to run or work out like the day, a couple days after doing it too, yes. because it, it fuels me. So I love that component of it. I'll never forget though, when I met you, so we're at the Drip Bar Conference in Nashville, <laughs> and I, there's certain people I just, I see there's meant for some reason why we connected. And and I was or I spoke on stage, then we met briefly, and I said, I, I love your haircut. And then you said, Well, there's a story to that, right? And and then I got pulled away because I was supposed to take a photo or something. Yes. And later we so we didn't connect that night. Was it the next day? Yes. Next day. And I said, Hey, I wanna meet before we go to the ceremony. Yeah. And we met and you told your story. Yes. And I knew instantly, I'm like, this person has the biggest why behind why to open her own drip bar location and for health and wellness. And that purpose and why is what fuels people to be very successful. Everybody has their own kind of why. And that stood out to me so much. That's why I was so excited about what you were doing and where you're going at the drip bar and, and just everything that's gonna happen with the drip bar and rise. So I just wanna congratulate you because you stood out that. instantly. <laughs> like you just like instantly, I'm like, this person is gonna do some big things. And even to add to it, you're opening the business with your son, so you yeah. guys are doing it together. Are you excited about that? What? <laughs> what's... There is no bigger blessing than having, um, Nick knows he's my favorite person in this world, and um, I am so proud of him for graduating in Providence College with yeah. a marketing and business education degree, and um, to bring him on board from the ground up, we're gonna be learning together. Um, Nick is an amazing, amazing guy that, you know, um, he's got what it takes actually to help me build this and I am so confident. So listen, I, having bought the franchise, having found this amazing space on Purchase Street and Rye, I am, I feel so blessed. I feel like things are really starting to um, come to fusion for me. And I am, I, I am so excited to be able to bring this business to my community so they can feel what it is that I feel. You know, I, I don't feel like I have to convince anybody about IV hydration, I just don't because the, the science is there, I'm living proof of it. 
um, you know, my, my family does it, and and I want to be able to bring this business, I want to be able to open my doors, I want to be able to show people that you can be proactive with your health, health, not just reactive. I think, honestly, I think the system is broken, and if I can help in any way and give back in any way, especially to my community and the surrounding communities, to come and check it out for yourself. There are so many benefits to this, and, and I think that everyone has to experience it for themselves. I agree. All right, so I'm looking forward. Maybe I'll be the first strip in your location. I can't Second wait. one, maybe Nick and I'll do it at the same time. That sounds Get great. Get some photos and videos of that. Yes. Uh, so what, where exactly the location? Where, where is so I'm fortunate that um, I am bringing this to my own hometown. And so it's in Rye, New York, and we're going to be at 20 Purchase Street, which mm -hmm. is um, it's an amazing location on, on the street. Um, we get many people, honestly, it's like people will, will um, they'll shop at little boutiques that are there. There's many restaurants that are there. Um, it's a community, you know. Um, there are kids walking around this community. I mean, just family after generation after generation have been there in this community. My own kids, um, you know, they'll get out of school, they'll walk the street, they'll come in, you know, um, just to kind of check out whoever yeah. is there, get their hair cut. You can do anything there. I mean, and it's a, it's, it's a very loving community, so I'm really fortunate. So the other thing I love about this is the drip bar is opening, location could be opening soon, yeah. and you're writing a book in the process. Yes. So you're telling your story, what just a few nuggets, like what can people expect when the book comes out, just some things they can take away you know, from the book. So for many years, um, people, they'll hear my story and say, oh gosh, you gotta write a, you gotta write a book. And I would always cringe about that because it's like, oh, like talking about yourself or, you know, uh, promoting yourself in any way. It's, you know, for me, that's hard, right? Because I've, I've always been about other people and supporting other people. And um, when I started uh, thinking about the franchise and I thought about how my story could actually impact someone else, I thought, this is the time now to share it. And so what I, what I want to do is I want to inspire people. I think inspiring people to show a few different things, to show that um, that you can survive cancer, you you definitely can, and so and to have the right support system in place, and also I always feel like if I can do it, anybody can do it. When it comes to opening a business, or when it comes to um, reaching out to this community that I really love, that I know they're going to support. Um, but in the book, I want to show people that it is a journey and everybody has a different journey and not a lot of people survive cancer once but twice and so i feel like honestly spiritually i feel like god gave me this opportunity to put myself out there and to show people that there is when there is a will there is a way and but i'll be honest when when god calls me to come home to him i will go yeah. until then i'm going to fight like hell and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there for my family. I'm gonna be there for my friends and my community, as I always have. Well, you are a great mother. You're a great friend. Just you're crushing it with Thank everything you do. I love how motivated you are. Thank you. It's a pleasure working with you. I appreciate. That. I ask this question to everybody, and to you, what does success mean? What does it mean to be a success to you, and where you are in life? Success to me means that I get better every day. Mm -hmm. And. I'm starting to feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. I think we all have our demons, we all have our doubts. And the more honest I am with myself, and that I believe in what it is that I am doing, the better I do get every day. Mm -hmm. And they're baby steps. And I'm starting to believe in myself more. And to Confidence. me, yeah. that's success. That's so good. What would be your advice in general to anybody listening right now? advice based off your years of experience from beating cancer to being a mother to everything what's your advice to anybody listening to have success well, in their own way ask my kids i do have a saying and it is today is not forever which means that if you're having a good day or a bad day it's not going to last mm -hmm. because tomorrow is a new day and have, you need to wake up each day fresh and new and start a new day because every day brings challenges but inside the challenges, we have to remember that's where the lessons are. Mm -hmm. And you need to build on that. And you know what? Lean on people. You don't have to do it by yourself. Lean yeah. on people. And that's 
what I want to try to provide to others, you can lean on us. That's so good. So people can follow you on social media. What are your handles? So personally, I am andrea.della.bura. Yep. And then you can also follow us at the dripbar.ry. I've enjoyed this episode. I know people are going to love this and we're going to get people that are going to reach out from this one. I appreciate thank you for everything you're doing. I'm excited for the oh, opening. Thank we're going to have fun. We're going to maybe want the yes. BTA drip by then. You just wait. And we'll we will, uh, we'll, we'll get a lot of content there. We'll do a follow up episode after the launch 100%. and we'll bring Nick on as well. Let's do it. And uh, I just want to say congratulations and everything thank you, you're Brandon. doing. Appreciate for, it. For all of you listening out there, be sure to follow her <laughs> and come get a drip and ride New York. And here's to your success.